so can you relate to this? The last time that my entire family was together, and I don't mean Tracy and, and our kids and our grandkids, but, but I mean our entire family, like um, our extended family, our aunts and uncles and, and first cousins and third cousins and everybody. The, the last time that we were together was exactly one year ago this week. And it was because we gathered to bury my 95-year-old grandmother, who swore she would make it to 95, and she did. It was a hot, I mean a blazing hot, July day a year ago. And we were gathered under that uh, scorching South Carolina sun. We were just in the upstate, and, and we were gathered in the same cemetery where we always gather when somebody dies. We were, in fact, in the same little family plot where we always circle up when somebody dies. Just a year prior to last July, we had been there the previous summer in 2018 because my uncle, my grandmother's son, uh, my uncle had died in 2018. We were there on that day, same cemetery, same family plot. And Prior to that, by about 10 years, we had been in that same location when my cousin uh, had died very young, 43 years old, I think, of a heart attack, died very suddenly, um, and we had gathered to bury him. And then if you go way back, we had been in that same family plot, in that same cemetery 30 years ago in 1988 when my grandfather the uh, husband of my grandmother who just died last year, he died 30 years ago, but uh, we buried him. Now the point I'm making to you is that we gathered in this same cemetery on this same little plot of ground over and over again, and the one thing that brought us together every time was the passing of somebody in our family. Now we did the exact same thing uh, in 2006 when my dad died. And we didn't go to South Carolina because he lived here. And in fact, it was just up the street here in West Memorial Park. But we gathered for my dad's funeral. And in that case, we didn't go down to South Carolina. The North Carolina folks didn't go to South Carolina. The South Carolina folks came to North Carolina. But this is the way it is, right? It, it doesn't matter where it happens or when it happens. Summer or fall or winter or spring, North Carolina, South Carolina, this state, that state. It doesn't really matter. When a family member dies, at least in my family, we get together. In fact, sometimes we joke about this, don't we? We say, man, I hadn't seen everybody in a long time, and well, somebody will die soon enough, and we'll all get to be together. It really is the way that it is. It's like the graveyard is the destination or the location of every unplanned but not unexpected family reunion. It's where we all always assemble. And it's almost like, I I don't know, maybe the the older I get, and I'm showing my age a little bit here by saying this, but the older I get, I, I tend to see this more clearly. It's like all of the family, all the generations of the family are just out here living our lives, you know, doing what we do. And over the passing of time, it's like, It's like the generations form a single file line and we're just marching in this very steady and deliberate cadence to the graveyard. And every time we go, we leave somebody there. We all gather and one of us stays as everybody else leaves. It really is the way that it is. And if that is true, then we must agree, mustn't we, that if Jesus is the sovereign Lord over all of life, and he is, then it must be true that he is the one leading that march. He's the one ultimately gathering us at the graveyard. Today I want to talk about this, and it's the reason I've asked you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to be talking about the fact that that God gathers us at the end of our lives. He gathers us to usher us into our eternal life destiny. You know, over the last month, we've been talking about this nature of God, this gathering nature of God, that he is a shepherd. He is he who gathers. 
And we've talked about the fact that God gathers us for uh, uh, worship, that it's our great privilege to assemble. We've had that privilege today as a, as a gathering here in Weaverville. We're joined by our gathering over at Merriman Avenue, and we're joined by our church family watching from home during this COVID crisis. We are assembled, and our privilege of being assembled is to give God worship. We talked about the fact a few week, uh, weeks ago that God gathers us to himself to give our lives great significance and great purpose and that he raises us up to be a mighty army to accomplish his work. We've discovered that he has a table in heaven and that he's gathering people to his table. And last week in Psalm 91, we discovered that God gathers us for our own care and protection and preservation. Today we're going to talk about how that God gathers us to the grave. And I want you to uh, follow along as I read only two verses today in uh, 2 Chronicles 34. Follow along beginning in verse number 27. Listen to these words. Because thine heart was tender, because your heart was tender and you did humble yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and you humbled yourself before me, and did rend your clothes and weep before me. I have even heard thee, says the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave. You will be gathered to your grave in peace, and neither shall your eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same." So they brought the word, or they brought the king word again. Now I realize that in reading just those two verses, there is nothing in this brief passage that tells you who it is to whom God is speaking. All you know by reading verses 27 and 28 is that God is speaking to a king and that this king is going to die. That's the information that we're given. It is a king who is going to die. Well, you don't have to look far to find out which king it is. Go one verse up only to verse number 26. It says, As for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what you shall say to him. So this passage records the voice of the Lord through the prophet speaking to the king of Judah. Now, by the way, you know Judah, don't you? Does everybody in the room know who the nation of Judah is? Would you mind if I gave about a three or four minute history lesson? If you're okay with me doing that, would you shout amen? Thank you. I was going to do it anyway, even if you hadn't said amen, but so thanks for encouraging me. If you're going to understand who the nation of Judah is, when you read a verse like verse 26, the king of Judah, you have to begin with the patriarch Abraham or Abram. God called Abram in Genesis 12, made a covenant with him and said to him, I'm going to give you descendants. You know the story. Abraham and his wife Sarah were too old to have kids. They had never been able to have children. God said, I'm going to give you a lot of grandchildren. One son and then many grandchildren following that. And so Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Now, Jacob's name was ultimately changed to Israel. And the name of the nation of Israel is actually the name of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, and his sons became the 12 tribes or the 12 clans of the family of Abraham and ultimately of the nation of Israel. Now, one of the great events in the, in the history of Israel, as most of you know, is that there came a time when they were taken uh, out of their homeland and they all traveled down to Egypt because of a famine in the land. And you know the story of Joseph being in Egypt. And they ended up living as a gathering of clans, a gathering of families, the families of Jacob, of Isaac, and of Abraham. They were living down in the land of Egypt. Ultimately, they were enslaved in Egypt. And we often say Israel was enslaved in Egypt, and they were. But they weren't really a nation when they were enslaved in Egypt. They were a family, a group of family clans. After 400 years as a large family living in slavery in Egypt, God delivered them. As you know, the deliverer was named, what's his name? Shout it, it was 
Moses, you got it. Moses, God raises up Moses to send him to take the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He leads them out of Egypt. They wander in the desert for 40 years. And at the end of that 40 years, Moses dies and God raises up Joshua. And Joshua takes them across the Jordan River and into the land of Canaan. Because when God had said to Abram, I'm going to give you descendants, this large family who will be a great nation, not only am I going to give you descendants, I'm going to give you a land where your descendants will live. And so Joshua finally takes this large family and moves them across into the land, the land of Canaan, that God had promised to give them. Now the truth is, when they moved into the land of Canaan, they still were not a nation, at least not in the strict sense of the word, when they lived or when they moved into Canaan, they were more so a loosely related group of 12 different clans or tribes. Sometimes they cooperated, other times they fought. They were one family, but they were really separate and divided in so many ways. This went on for 400 more years until finally they nationalized. And they nationalized and became one, one true people, one nation, under King Saul, who was the very first king that they ever had. Now, the nation that was born on that day under King Saul only remained intact for about 100 years. Now, they were golden years. They were great years. But it was only about a century that they remained intact. This was during the reign of King Saul, followed by King David, the greatest king of Israel, and then followed by his son, King Solomon. One nation, the nation of Israel, under kings Saul, David, and Solomon. Following the death of Solomon, if y'all are still with me, say amen. amen. Following the death of Solomon, the nation divided. And when it divided, it divided into 10 tribes. They retained the nation of Israel and two tribes, 10 northern tribes, two southern tribes. They took the name of the nation of Judah. And so when you read in the Bible, he was the king of Judah. He's not the king of the entire nation of Israel. He's the king of the nation of the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. These were the tribes that ultimately, Judah ultimately fell to the Babylonians and the Israelites some years before had fallen to the Assyrian Empire. Well, back to the passage, history lesson over. When the Bible says in chapter 34, verse 26, he is the king of Judah, it is the king of those two southern tribes. Now, jo uh, Josiah is the king's name. If you'll look back in verse number 1, chapter 34, verse 1, you'll find his name. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He began to reign as an eight-year-old boy. The throne came to him because of his father's death at the, at the young age of eight. Of course, under tutors and governors until he, until he matured and grew. But he was the king. And he was one of the last kings of Judah and in fact, he was the final good king of Judah. Josiah is known for the reforms that he brought to Jerusalem and to the Jewish people. He's known for the revival that he led and the rebuilding of the temple of God. He really is an incredibly important figure in the national history of Judah and of Israel and in the spiritual renewal of God's people as well. And you would think, wouldn't you, that if he was that important of a figure... His story would occupy volumes, at least chapter after chapter in the Word of God, and yet it doesn't. His entire life is chronicled in two chapters, 2 Chronicles chapter number 34 and 35, a couple of chapters in 1 Kings as well, or 2 Kings as well. But the point is, here's this great man who had this uh, significant and impacting life and yet he only gets a couple of chapters in the Word of God. It's pretty instructive for us, isn't it? Because we tend to think we're sort of all that in a bag of chips, don't we? I mean, we like to think we are. We like to think that we're just really this important and significant person. And we want to be in our lifetimes and in the world that God gives to us to live in. But the truth is, in the chronicles of eternity and history, we're probably only a verse or two in God's great work. Maybe a chapter or two if you're as significant as Josiah was. He gets two chapters, chapters 34 and 35. And here's the point. It is that our lives, no matter how significant or insignificant they may seem, our lives on this side of the grave are a couple of verses worth or a couple of chapters worth. It's just brief. 
But our lives on the other side of the grave are eternal. Do you understand? And if our lives on the other side of the grave are eternal, don't you think we should take some of our brief life in this time and prepare for the eternal life that's coming after the grave? Well, Josiah did, and his life is instructive to us. I want you to write down something that really is born right out of verse number 28 of chapter number 34. It's important for all of us to know. Write it down. It is that this passage teaches us that we will all be gathered to our fathers. Every one of us, every person sitting in this church today, every person at Merriman, every person watching online, every one of us will be gathered to our fathers one day. Did you notice that interesting phrase? I think it's an intriguing phrase in verse 28. Let me show it to you again. Why don't you underline it? Verse 28, behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers. And again, you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. It's an interesting turn of phrase. Gathered to your fathers. The word gather means exactly what you would think it means. It means to be assembled together. And he says in this passage, you will be assembled or gathered together in your grave. Are you listening? With your fathers. That's the point of the verse. You will be gathered together in your grave with your fathers. And Josiah is not the only person in the Bible of whom this is said or to whom this interesting statement is made. Look at Genesis 35 and verse 29, spoken of Isaac the son of Abraham, the Bible says, and Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. There's that phrase again. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. Can I just say, by the way, side note, that's who I want to be. I want to be gathered to my people when I am old and full of days. And I don't want anybody to say when they walk by my casket, he looks good. Don't say that if you come to my visitation. I want you to say, he looks tired. He left it all on the field. No, he was old and full of days, and he was gathered to his people. And then it goes on to say, Jacob and Esau, those are his sons, they buried him. I mentioned a moment ago that it seems as if the generations form a single file line and march in this steady cadence to the grave. This is represented in these verses in Genesis because Isaac dies and is gathered to his people in Genesis 35. Look at Genesis 49. After Jacob buries his father Isaac, Then some years later, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last, and here it is, and was gathered to his people. Isaac was gathered to his people, then his son buried him, and then his son was gathered to his people and was buried. Numbers 20 and verse 24 speaks of Aaron. Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. Isaac was gathered to his people. Jacob gathered to his people. Aaron gathered to his people. Josiah gathered to his people. There's one other one I want to show you. I'm not going to put it on the screen because I want you to turn to it. It's, it's so significant. Will you turn back a few pages to Deuteronomy? You're so close to it. It's just a few pages back. Fifth book of the Bible. Go to Deuteronomy 32, if you will. Deuteronomy 32, and look at verses 48 and 49 and 50. God is speaking to Moses, the great deliverer, who leads God's people out of Egypt to the promised land. Verse 48, the Lord spake to Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against or right next to Jericho. And behold, or view, the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel for a possession. Now, by the way, I've been there. I've stood on that very plot of ground, that very mountain, Mount Nebo, where Moses stood and looked at the land of Israel. And it really is a panoramic view when you stand there. On a clear day, it's as if you can see the entire land of the nation of Israel. You're looking just across the river into the land of Canaan. God said to Moses, I want you to go and I want you to see the land, but you're not going to go in. Verse 50, you will die in the mountain where you are going up. And what will, be happen, when, uh, what will happen when you die? You will be gathered unto your people as Aaron thy brother died in, the Mount, Hor, uh, in Mount Hor and he was gathered unto his people. It's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? 
you will be gathered to your fathers or gathered to your people. Now, it's obvious to all of us that when the Bible says you will be gathered to your fathers, it means it's speaking of the death of a person and their burial. Now, it also has a deeper, far more significant and spiritual meaning. We'll get to that in a second. But let's begin by talking about the very practical, the very pragmatic discussion or what's in mind in the scripture when someone dies, how their body is handled. I should begin by telling you that in the ancient Eastern world, burials were not handled the way that they are handled in our very modern Western and sterile world. And I would just suggest to you that it's a good thing. It's okay that we don't do it the way they used to. I like the way we manage the burial of a body here. Thank you. But in the Eastern world, it was very different. What they would do in that ancient Eastern world is that when someone died, their body would be uh, anointed. You remember from the death of Jesus how that the women came and they, they brought, uh, even Nicodemus brought spices and oils and ointments to anoint the body of Jesus. So the body would be anointed. It would then be wrapped in a shroud and then it would be placed in a tomb. Now most often in, in the Middle East, these were Uh, tombs that were cut out of a rock or they would even very often be just natural caves where you would put a body in the cave and then cover the opening to the cave and leave the body there. Now the body would go there for one year and at the end of that one year the family would know the day, they would mark the calendar, they would go about their lives. On the one year anniversary of that burial they would all come back together for the uh, to to, uh, the grave. Now they would come for one reason. And that was because through the process of that year, something would always happen to the body. Now, if you're not too queasy this Sunday morning, say amen. (laughs) Yeah, okay, I'm not going to get too graphic here. But here's what would happen over the course of those 12 months. The body would decompose. It would decompose completely. And by the end of that one year, the flesh would have melted away and, and, and decomposed. And really, all that would be left was the skeleton. And so when they would regather a year later, they were coming to gather up the bones of the skeleton. Now, in the, in the country of Egypt, they would put their, those bodies in what is called, it's really a stone casket, but it's called a sarcophagus. You heard that word before, a sarcophagus? The word sarcophagus means flesh eater. Literally, that's what it means. So they put the body in a flesh eater so that the, the, the flesh would be eaten away. And then they come back a year later and they gather up the bones. The bones would then be placed in a small, about the size of my podium top, the, 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 uh, the bones would be placed in a small casket, a little stone casket. It's called an ossuary, but not a casket like you think of where it's got to be six feet long or, or longer for a full body laid out. You would just gather the bones up and pile them in, put the skull on top and you're done, right? Here's a picture of one, in fact. Now that's a very ornate one. That's believed to be Caiaphas the high priest. That was his ossuary. So very rich man, very ornate and carved. Usually they weren't like that. They were just simple stone boxes. But the family would come back, they would gather up the bones, they would put them in the bone box, and then they would go to a very special room. Oftentimes within the same tomb or cave, there would be niches cut out in the wall, and they would put the box in there in these special rooms. And guess what else was in those special rooms? If y'all listening, say amen. Well, the bone boxes of previous generations in that family were in that room. So when God says you will be gathered, literally your bones will be gathered and you will be gathered unto your fathers, you literally were gathered into a little box and put in the same room with your father and your grandfather and your mother and your grandmother and your distant cousin and all of the family was gathered together. That's what the Bible means. It's the very real practical interpretation of you will be gathered to your fathers. Here's the fact. Just like Josiah and Isaac and Jacob and Aaron and Moses, just like they were gathered to their fathers, you can mark this down, one day you will be gathered to your fathers. And so will I. Do you know the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 2, it is better for us to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting 
For this, the house of mourning, is the end of all mankind. And the living will lay it to heart. The Bible says it is good for you to fall in line, to make your way to a cemetery, and to lay someone that you love in that grave. It's not pleasant. It's not, it's not fun. It breaks our hearts. But Ecclesiastes says it is good for you to do it because when you do it, you remember this, that one day you will be the one left in the grave. That one day the family will gather again and you will be the one who will not walk away from that gathering. We will all one day be gathered to our fathers. And so we need to learn, don't we, how to prepare for that day. If I'm going to die one day, if I'm going to be gathered to my fathers, I need to be ready for that day. So how can I prepare? Well, Josiah's life is a great example to us. Let's learn from him. Number one, write it down. If you want to be ready for the day when you're gathered to your fathers, we should begin by seeking after the Lord. Begin today to seek after the Lord. You'll see this in 2 Chronicles 34 and verse number 3. Verse 1 tells us Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And verse 3 says, in the eighth year, Of his reign. Now stop right there. If he was eight when he began to reign, and in the eighth year of his reign, do the math, how old was he in verse three? 16. When Josiah was 16 years old, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David. Now I called it the God of his father David. I call this Josiah's salvation moment. You know, Josiah was surrounded by some bad influences. His father, his grandfather, these were not good kings and they were false worshipers, pagan idol worshipers. They were part of the reason God's judgment was coming on Israel. They were really, really bad influences. But back in his generations, his great, 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 great grandfather, David, was a great example of a man that walked with God. And he began to look beyond the short-term influences and the the most present influencers in his life. And he looked to his ancestor, David, and he wanted to seek the Lord. Here's what I want to say to you. That if you want to be ready for the day that you die, the day that you, like Jacob, gather your legs up under your covers and close your eyes for the last time and draw your last breath and they gather together to lay your body down if you want to be ready. Begin today, no matter how old you are, to seek the Lord in salvation, to make sure that you know Jesus as your Savior. Often, God calls us to salvation when we're young. Often, not always, not only so. But often when we're young, it happened for Josiah when he was 16 years old, God began to draw his heart. I love that because I was 16 years old when God called me to faith and when I got saved. But many people get saved when they're 8 or 10 or 12 or 15. Others later in life, but here's what I want you to know, that no matter how old you are, you're always young enough to seek the Lord in salvation. And if you haven't done that yet, do so today. Make sure that Jesus is your Savior. The second thing that we can learn from Josiah is not only that we need to seek the Lord in salvation, but we should then continue to purify your life. This is the issue of sanctification. Once we know the Lord, then we ought to want God to be honored in our lives. Look at verse number three again. From the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, 16 years old, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year of his reign, so do the math, he was eight when he came to the throne, 12 years later, he's 20 When he's 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Now, I have to tell you that for a 20-year-old young man, that's still very young, for a 20-year-old man to confront the idolatry that was so prevalent in the land of Israel in that day took a great amount of passion and courage. He looked around. Here's a 20-year-old young man king coming into his own, beginning to own his faith, understanding how that God needs to be honored. And Josiah knew, listen, that to know him was not enough, that God should be honored in his life as well. And he wanted his legacy and his life and his people and his family and his kingdom to be a place where God was honored. And he looked around and he saw nothing but idolatry. The Bible in verse number three talks about the high places and the groves. What are those? There's there's nothing but pagan ritual sites. These are places where where 
the Jewish people's hearts had been turned away from God and they were worshiping gods that didn't even exist. It goes on in verses 3 and 4 and 5 to say that he takes the molten images and grinds them to powder. What are the molten images? These are brass or silver or gold icons, little gods that you might sit on your mantle, little icons like a, like a Buddha that you might see somewhere, these little icons that they would bow down to and worship. It talks about in this passage, it talks about the carved images. They would take a, a piece of timber, carve a god, a face or a, a, an icon into it, and then bow down and worship. And this was going on throughout the entire land and even in the very temple of God. Josiah said, enough. We're not going to live this way anymore. We're not going to worship these false idols anymore. We are going to worship God. And he sought the Lord for his purity, for God's purity in his own life and the purity in his nation. If you want to be ready when they call you and gather your bones to your grave, then you begin to live in a way where the Spirit of God, you're so surrendered, He's cleansing your life and making it more and more pure. Now, I want to say something to you. As a guy who has stood over hundreds of bodies in 30 years of ministry, who's performed hundreds of funerals, and who has had to hear moms and dads and and sons and daughters say things to me as they look down grieving at their departed loved one, well... I know their life wasn't really what it should have been, but I believe they're in heaven because they prayed a prayer when they were eight or 10 or 12 and, 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 and they have to look at your life and wonder and hope that you're in heaven because of something that happened when you were a kid. Don't ever put your family in that situation. You live in such a way to the glory of God that when you die, nobody has to wonder if you went to heaven or not. They say the testimony of her life was that she knew Jesus as her Savior. Don't you put your family in that position. Josiah said, I want my life to be pure. I want people to honor my God because of the purity and the transformation they see in my life. If you want to be ready for the day that you pass, you need to seek him in salvation and Allow him to continue to purify your life. There's a third thing that you'll find it in verses 8, 9, and 10. If you want to be ready for the day that you're going to die, you should build the house of God. This has to do with Josiah's ministry. You should build the house of God. Look at verse number 8. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, how old is he? He's 8 when he comes to the throne. In the 18th year, he's 26 years old. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, that's the temple, he, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of uh, Joahaz, Joahaz, the recorder, he sent them to repair the house of the Lord his God. Now, why did it need repairing? Because over the years of neglect and idolatry, the house of God, the temple, had fallen into disrepair. It was a mess, it was a wreck. It needed to be repaired, it needed to be fixed. And so they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and they delivered unto him the money that was brought to the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered at the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and the remnant of Israel and all of Judah and Benjamin. And they returned to Jerusalem and they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. They gave it to the workmen who wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and to amend the house. And here's the thing. Josiah, when he was 26 years old, looked at the temple. All the idols were gone, but the temple was a wreck. He said, this can't stand. This is the house of God for all nations. This is the house that's to declare his glory. It can't look like this. So he he sent out the, the, uh, uh, the officials to gather throughout the land offerings and temple tax to bring it in and to pay the workers to rebuild the temple or to repair the temple of God. Now, we should do the same, and I'm not talking about a building project physically, but I am saying that if you want to be ready when it comes time to die, here's what I would suggest to you. Live for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live for the work of the ministry. Invest your life, invest your time, invest your gifts, your energies, your resources, praying, serving, working, giving, so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forth, whatever that looks like for you. If you want to be ready when you die, live your life to advance the fame and the glory and the gospel of Jesus. One more thing. 
We can learn from Josiah if we want to be ready for the day when they gather our bones that we should begin to believe the word of God. This has to do with his devotion life. We should believe and receive the word of God. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 of chapter 34 says, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book unto Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word again, saying, All that was commanded to thy servants, they do it. They have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord. They have delivered it into the hand of the overseers, into the hand of the workmen. Verse 18, by the way, Shaphan said to the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. You know what the book was? It was the scroll of, of the word of God. It was the Torah, the law, the book of, books of Moses. Can you imagine this? Are y'all listening? In Josiah's day, because of the neglect, because of the neglect of the house of God and the idol worship and the turning away from the word of God, the very word of God had been completely lost. Imagine Josiah. At 26 years of age, he had never heard the word of Moses, the word of God through Moses being read. He had only heard of the word of God. And now at the age of 26, suddenly the Hilkiah the priest finds the scroll of the word of God. It's delivered to the king. And the king says, read it to me. And they begin to read to him Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and where God said through Moses, today I set before you life and death and blessing and cursing. Choose life that you may live and be blessed and not cursed. And Josiah knew that his people had chosen cursing and death and that the judgment of God was on its way. And so he tears his clothes, he rips his clothes in repentance and he calls the people to repent. But here's the point, Josiah was a guy who received and responded to the word of God. Are you? Now listen, I've been preaching for a long time. I know what happens when I or anyone stands to preach. For many of us, it's almost like a Teflon shield goes up. It's like the cone of silence. <laughs> it's like we can't even hear it sometimes. The word of God begins, it's like, and it just bounces off. It can't penetrate our hard hearts. Or else, some of us fashion ourselves as the director of the word of God. We, are, we believe to direct those, those points at other people. It's like we come in with a shield over our head, a deflector. You'll hear the pastor saying something important. You go, oh yeah, sister so-and-so needs that. Boing! And you'll deflect it her way or his way. And all the while, God wants it to penetrate your heart. Josiah was a guy who when he heard the word of God, he fell to his knees. He ripped his clothing in repentance and he said, oh God, be merciful to us. Now the fact of the matter is, none of us knows when we're going to be gathered to our fathers. We don't. I mentioned my grandfather who died in 1988, ripe old age. Nobody was surprised. My grandmother died when she was 95. We were surprised that she lived to be that old, let alone nobody was surprised when she passed. But I mentioned my cousin. My cousin died about 10 years ago with his family, in a restaurant, having dinner. He took a bite and fell to the floor dead. Like that. None of us knows when they will gather our bones. But here's what I will tell you. That if you will seek the Lord in salvation, if you will live a life where he is making you more and more like himself, more holy, purging your life to be more like his, if you will live a life devoted to his gospel work, building the ministry, and if you will live a life where the word of God is your guide and it transforms you as you receive it and believe it, then I will promise you that whenever, if you'll live like Josiah, that whenever you die, young or old, suddenly or after a long and difficult illness, you will die in peace. Isn't that what Josiah was told? Look at verse 28 again. Verse number 28, Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Well, I should tell you that Josiah didn't die in peace. He didn't. 
the next chapter, chapter 35, tells us exactly how he died. He didn't die in a peaceful room, in a soft bed with his family gathered around, dabbing his brow with a cold cloth. Look at it, chapter 35, verse number 23. He dies in a battle. The archers shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am sore or severely wounded. You know how King Josiah died? This man who sought the Lord, was purified, loved the house of God, and and believed and received the word of God. He died in a battle. He died in the chaos of of a war. He died with the pain of an archer's arrow through his chest. The Bible goes on in the next verse to say, his servants therefore took him out of his chariot, put him in a second chariot, and they began to speed their way to Jerusalem like like an ambulance chariot, getting him out of the battle. He died struggling to breathe with an arrow in his chest, with the grinding wheels of the chariot and the flaring nostrils of the horses and the galloping of the hoofbeats and the clash of, of soldiers' spears and the screaming and the yelling and the smoke. He died in chaos but he died in peace, peace with God. Now, I don't know how you're going to die. I hope it's peacefully in a bed. But however it is, if you will learn the lessons of Josiah, you will die with peace, even if there's chaos going on around you. Do you understand? We're all going to be gathered to our fathers one day, and we need to be ready. Now, there's one other thing, just just one quick thing I need to tell you. It's important to see this in this idea that one day we will all be gathered to our fathers. I mentioned that this is a very practical, very pragmatic reason and way that you deal with a body in the ancient world, but there's a, a deeper sense of being gathered to your fathers. Let me just give that to you before we go home. Write it down. It is that we will all be gathered with someone in eternity. When the Bible says that we will be gathered to our fathers, it doesn't just mean in the grave, in the bone boxes. It means in eternity. Let me show you what Genesis says. Again, Genesis 35, verse 29. We read this a moment ago about Isaac. Look at it. And Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. By the way, that's the way I want to die, old and full of days. He gathered was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Now watch this. He breathed his last and died. He was gathered to his people, and then they buried him. That verse can't just be talking about gathering his bones in the ossuary with the other ossuaries, the other bones. He was gathered to his people before they buried him. Here's what I want you to know. If y'all are listening, shout amen. There is an eternity, and you will be gathered with those who have gone before. And if you know Jesus as your Savior... If Christ has forgiven you of your sins, when you die, you will be gathered to those who have gone on before you. What a day that will be. You know, we had a a precious lady and her young daughter visiting with us in the first service. And she had never been here before. And I met her after the first service. And she came to me and said, "It it was divine timing that I was here for the first time today. Because she said, my 17 year old daughter died four years ago today. And I can't wait to see her again. You will be gathered with someone. And hopefully it'll be with those who who are in your family, those that you've loved and known and they've gone on before you. And if you know Christ, you will be gathered with them. But, But you have to hear me say this. If you don't know Jesus, if you reject Jesus Christ and die in your sins, you will be gathered as well. Not with your loved ones in heaven in the presence of God. But you will be gathered with every Christ rejecter throughout history and the fires of hell and the presence of Satan himself where there is not love and reunion but there is hate and darkness and punishment there is a gathering I hope you're headed to the right one when I was little we used to take family vacations together with my grandfather. My mother's father was a pastor and a barber, bivocational pastor and a barber for 50 years. He always pastored little churches in upstate South Carolina and the mountains of Georgia and little tiny churches way out in the woods with no indoor plumbing and no air conditioning. And I grew up in these, in these little churches and 
And my grandfather uh, would always preach the gospel and talk about heaven and preach about uh, eternity in heaven. And he loved to sing an old hymn. Now, by the way, before I tell you what hymn that was, we would take family vacations together. My grandfather had this old white Cadillac. It was like a 1960-some model Cadillac. And this thing was as long as the Titanic. I mean, it, and it just floated down the road. And we would all pile in this and, and make the six-hour drive down to Myrtle Beach together. And there was no such thing as a seatbelt. Who knew seatbelts in those days? And we had more family members in that Cadillac than you'd find in a clown car at the circus piling out of it. I mean, we were stacked in there, laying up in the back in the windshield. <laughs> and he would just drive down the road, just flying. That thing just floating down the road and bouncing. And he would roll the windows down. Every window would be down. One time we almost lost a cousin flying out. The, I'm joking. We couldn't turn the air conditioning on because it burned too much gas. He'd have all the windows down. And he'd just throw that arm out the window and one arm on the steering wheel. And he would sing at the top of his lungs, when the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. And sometimes we'd think, we're all going to be there this, this morning, <laughs> the way we're traveling. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there. You remember that song? Some of y'all remember that hymn? I looked up the lyrics. You know what the first verse says? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright, and fair, when, all the, uh, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. There is a gathering. And can I tell you? Let me testify. I'll be there.